engaging as much as possible. Um, and so I am going to just start out really quick talking about this general uh, greenhouse gases and like why we're here today. And then we're going to have um, Rose Graves with the Nature Conservancy talk with us a little bit uh, about working lands and natural carbon climate solutions. And then we're going to do a couple of us here in the room. We'll take a break so that we can chat about it. Uh, and then we'll come back and be kind of fluid. Obviously, not a ton of people here uh, to contribute. And so we're excited to have some of these uh, conversations a little bit more in depth than um, we did last night. We got very in depth last night. So, um, a lot of people know, uh, a lot of people in the room here heard last night that the reason that we're here is because we're participating with the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality uh, uh, Climate Pollution Reduction Grant. And so this is um, money that has been available to do greenhouse gas reduction planning in anticipation for a uh, funds and implementation dollars that is gonna be coming this winter. Uh, and so um, we want to make sure that our priorities are in this uh, priority climate action plan that's due in March so that we can be in line for some of this money and make sure that it's going to communities that are most impacted by climate change. So I'm not going to really go over the why of the greenhouse gases. We all kind of have a sense of why carbon is important and why we're needing to have conversations about it. But I just wanted to again highlight the fact that we are, this is part of a greenhouse gas inventory effort. Uh, we're trying to get a handle on how much greenhouse gases are being generated by communities in Oregon and where we would like to see sequestration, pull the carbon out of the atmosphere uh, and put it into whatever sources it is that we're choosing to put it into so that it's not affecting our atmosphere uh, at all. And uh, the one thing that I wanted to highlight on here is that carbon markets are really a part of this conversation. There are opportunities for the people who are doing the emitting uh, to work with communities who are able to pull carbon out of the atmosphere uh, and exchange dollars for those services uh, so that we can try and get a handle on some of this stuff. And so I am going to turn it over to Rose. Did you have slides that you wanted to share? I would love for you to come off mute if you're willing. Thank you, a presenter. Yep, you are. I am working my slides. Um, so there we go. You should see some slides now. There's so many things on my screen that that it's hard to find the unmute button sometimes. So there we go. Um. So as Colleen mentioned, um, my name is Rose Graves and I'm a scientist working with the Nature Conservancy in Oregon. And for the last five years, I've been studying how nature can help us to avoid the worst impacts of climate change, which we call cl natural climate solutions. Um, and I just wanna thank you for being here and hearing me today. And um, I'm gonna start by talking about what, what do we mean when we say natural climate solutions? These are actions that we can take on natural and working lands that protect ecosystems from degradation and conversion, restore ecosystems and their processes, and change management on working lands, which can lead to decreases in greenhouse gases. As you may know or may have learned from Colleen just now, reducing greenhouse gases is a critical step in avoiding the worst of climate change impacts. And carbon sequestration is the process of removing and storing atmospheric carbon dioxide, so one of the greenhouse gases, in carbon sinks such as forests, agricultural soils, etc. Our lands and waters globally already do a tremendous amount to balance our climate by already sequestering about 40% of the current fossil fuel emissions. And the idea behind natural climate solutions is to engage in activities that will increase the amount of carbon that our lands and waters can store, which in addition to reducing fossil fuel emissions can help to decrease the greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. And so when we talk about these, um, what do I, I think the top line take home from my presentation that I want folks to have is that the natural and working lands in Eastern Oregon have a role to play in reducing climate change impacts. Um, when thoughtfully planned and implemented, these natural climate solutions can increase the resilience 
uh, and help to meet Oregon's recommended goal of increasing net carbon sequestration on natural and working lands by 5 million metric tons by uh, 2035. But what do we mean? What can we actually do? Um, so when we talk about natural and working lands in Eastern Oregon, the types of things that we might think about doing that could be natural climate solutions are things like deferring timber harvest and replanting after wildfires, avoiding the conversion of forests and grasslands into, um, into land uses that don't sequester or store as much carbon, we can think about restoring and reforesting riparian areas and protecting and restoring the sagebrush step. And indeed, when taken all together, these natural climate solutions really do have a pretty tremendous potential to be additional to the fossil fuel mitigation and help us um, substantially decrease greenhouse gases. This figure is from um, some research of ours that was published in 2020. Um, and I'm happy to share that with anyone in the future and go, uh, go into more detail if you would like in the questions. So where can we do these kinds of natural climate solutions? When we think about Eastern Oregon, we're thinking about the riparian areas, we're thinking about the grasslands, the sagebrush steppe, and to some extent, the forests. What do natural climate solutions look like? Um, I'm gonna give a little case study or deep dive into the riparian area restoration and protection. So reforestation, which involves the reestablishment of woody vegetation on previously um, cleared or degraded riparian areas is a really effective tool for sequestering carbon. It also has tremendous uh, benefits beyond the carbon benefits. So we know that revegetating along streams that have lost their vegetation helps to shade and decrease the water temperatures. Um, it also can provide really important habitat for birds and for other, other species. Importantly, Oregon has a tremendous opportunity to increase the kinds of restoration that we're talking about along riparian areas. There are up to 500,000 acres of opportunity, at least estimated uh, both by TNC in Oregon and TNC, uh, nat the Nature Conservancy's global team. Um, and this represents the opportunity to plant more trees along the rivers and streams. And as shown in this flood plain and streamside buffers map, which was produced by the Nature Conservancy and American Forests. Um, this map, I, I wanted to draw your attention to two pieces of it. Um, down here in this corner, you'll see the scale bar goes from low to high. And what we're just simply representing here is at the scale of the county, what is the potential in terms of um, climate mitigation that you could get from reforesting floodplains or revegetating flood floodplains in each county. Unsurprisingly, there's really high productivity in forests and in um, in wetter areas on the west side of the state, but I wanted to draw your attention to the high potential that this kind of natural climate solution can have in the northeastern part of the state in particular. In fact, at the state scale, replanting forests in habitats along streams and rivers is estimated to have the second highest climate mitigation benefit of 12 activities that we've evaluated. It's also a really common restoration tactic in Oregon. So the, over the last 25 years, between, I guess it's more than that, between 1995 and 2021, according to OWEB, there's been more than 22,000 acres of revegetation occurring. And this, um, this is often done to support those other benefits beyond just the carbon. One of the things that the Nature Conservancy is doing is trying to help understand the benefits that we are getting from that riparian revegetation. And we're doing a study in conjunction with the University of Oregon and Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board to evaluate past plantings so that we can better inform moving forward um, 
provide tools and metrics so that as we increase this kind of natural climate solution on the land, we can better account for the climate benefit that we're getting from it. And finally, I wanted to um, emphasize that the Nature Conservancy recognizes that carbon isn't the only goal um, from how we manage and interact with our natural and working lands. And many of these activities that provide natural climate solutions also provide tremendous local benefits. They increase the amount of habitat that's intact for multiple species, can lead to cleaner and more abundant water, resilient natural and human communities to climate change and other disturbances. In some cases, it can enhance local livelihoods. It can increase soil health and reduce erosion and reduce pollution and provide cleaner air. All of this leads to healthier natural and human communities in addition to helping us avoid the worst impacts of climate change. Um, I'm gonna leave you with this, this quote and then take any questions or Colleen, did you wanna wait on questions until I'll let you decide that. But. Um, but I do want to emphasize that fossil fuel emission reduction, transitioning to renewable energies, et cetera, is critical for tackling climate change. But what we know is that it's also impossible, and as our global director of climate science says, frankly arrogant to think that we can do it alone without nature. N nature plays a critical role in our ability to reduce the impacts of climate change on our natural and human communities. So I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. I am not able to hear in the hear room. now? Yes, now I can. There was a lot of background noise. Sorry, there was somebody it was extremely loud. Um, we, we had an opportunity to have kind of a preliminary about this last night and so we had one pc radcliffe joined us and kind of shared some of the same information that you shared with us today um, i was wondering if you could the scales that we're looking at for these things you know um, we talk about the need to reduce carbon as quickly as possible but it's also important to not be changing the land in a way that it can't respond to climate change like I find it at odds to plan for carbon, but then also plan for resilient communities. Like I think these are two different things. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I was wondering if you could speak maybe to the time scale benefits for working lands. Yeah, that's a um, that's a great question. I missed a couple pieces of what you were saying, and so I, I would say if you're in the room and you're trying to talk, try to get as close to the microphone as you can. Um, I was kind of in and out on some of the words. So I think what you were asking was around the time scale and sort of the, the intersection between resilience and mitigation from natural and working lands, which I think is a really important, um, important thing to think about. I, uh, so one, one thing that we understand is that in order to, um, avoid the the most major impacts of climate change we need to have action very soon uh and in when we talk about action very soon we the the sort of the power of nature to to become a larger sink of carbon uh we're really thinking about the short short and long term i th i think is a good way to Think about that. So when we're talking about things like reforestation potential, um, that is essentially adding carbon sequestration somewhat immediately, right? As as soon as things start growing, they're pulling out um, carbon from the atmosphere. At the same time, we have to think about those as being the right plant in the right place so that they are durable and resilient into the future. And so there's, it, it's, it's interesting that you think of them as sort of uh, as um, conflicting because to me they become actually very similar in that respect that we want to be thinking about 
which things are going to persist into the future. What do we need to plant or what do we need to pay attention to within that local environment to make sure that we're um, planning for the survivability and the um, maintenance of these places so that they continue to do the work of sequestering carbon into the future. Um, does that help to answer your question, Colleen? I wasn't, I was missing some words there. So that was my best yeah. guess at what your well, question was about. Yeah, no, thank you. I think you did a really good job, especially from the working lands perspective. And I'm gonna, the microphones are in the ceiling, unfortunately, so I can't really get closer to them. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's great design. Um, and so, no, I was saying that it's a different, it feels, maybe this is true for less the working lands and more for some of these other things that like planning for carbon reduction is a slightly different thing than planning for resilient communities. And I appreciate that we started this conversation with the working lands because I think that this is where it is the closest, like you said. Um, I find it, it kind of diverges, I think, for some of these other strategies, but I appreciate that we're, we're, we're highlighting the working lands. Does anyone else have questions? I just, I wanted to, um, to confirm what, because you mentioned the number two was riparian restoration and reforestation of the 12 pathways. Is the first one in your work? Um, changing the frequency of timber harvest or defer, defer it harvest. is it is and the and um one of the things that i there's a lot of nuance to that particular one and so for the the work that that the nature conservancy that i led um in that published paper in 2020 we we didn't consider um deferring timber harvest in eastern oregon um, we were really focused on Western Oregon in that case, um, primarily because of the, the combination of high productivity and lower fire risk. And so um, there, are, there are studies and there's increasing evidence that forest restoration treatments may um, have climate mitigation benefits as well, but because the, there's um, because fires are a real and present risk, uh, we didn't want to emphasize not harvesting in places where restoring natural fire regimes through both thinning and um, fire might be actually the best thing for those landscapes. Um, so from the Nature Conservancy's perspective, natural climate solutions aren't just about the carbon. They're about um, thinking through where that is most appropriate as an activity. So for instance, we know that we could um, plant hybrid poplar all over the place and, and really suck a lot of carbon out of the atmosphere really quickly, but that might not be the thing that's most appropriate for the ecosystem. And so when we talk about deferring timber harvest, um, and particularly in that paper where we did that analysis, um, we focused on areas where we were more confident that that would be beneficial to the ecosystem rather than in places where it's more a little bit more nuanced and complex. Thank you. Is there anyone online that has questions? Now would be the time to pipe up or write something in the chat that we could Related to our expert. I think we're all a little tired this Friday morning. And so I'm really grateful to you. Do you have final thoughts that you might want to leave us with? Knowing, okay, so here's, I guess, my final question. Knowing that we, there will be funding available for some of this work, what are some things that you have found to be challenges to implementing this kind of the natural car, climate solutions? Uh, and what are some places where you see opportunity to expand, particularly in Eastern Oregon? I know that that's not quite your expertise, but um, I would appreciate your thoughts on those two challenges and opportunities. Um, that's a good question. I think so when. So one of the when, when we are looking at the natural and working lands and specifically the natural climate solutions side of that. We're not really talking about um, 
some of the on-farm greenhouse gases here. But when when we think about natural and working lands, I think um, there is a tension between um, the changing climate. And I, like when I think about that, I think about drought and I think about some of the water needs of some of the natural climate solutions that we've discussed. Um, we didn't talk about it here because I know someone else uh, is going to talk about it, but things like cover crops, et cetera, that do have water needs. Um, I think there's some tension between um, a lim limited supply of water and, and where that water is going on the landscape. Um, Sometimes that is a rightfully placed concern about the tension. And I think sometimes it's uh, it's also sort of misunderstanding how water moves around a landscape. And so I think that that's some of it is sort of understanding the role that water plays and the role that these natural climate solutions or, or the impacts natural climate solutions may have or may not have on water. Um, we have also talked a lot about, um, so, Separately in rangelands, we really think about like defending the core. So keeping intact sagebrush step intact. And, um, we, you know, that's, that is also a natural climate solution, but we, um, there, there are considerable challenges with respect to that. Uh, but one of the places that we see really promising in Eastern Oregon is again, this revegetation along riparian areas and restoration of sort of the wetland or wetter areas of the rangelands. Um, and some of that is challenging because, um, so I was just talking with another researcher in the John Day area who had done some plantings and has done some, um, some really wonderful research that shows the, the shade benefits and the benefits on fish habitat from, from doing this kind of planting. And when I was talking to him about, you know, the survival rates and the things like that of the trees, um, there's tremendous browse pressure. And so there's a lot of, it's a, it's, it can be expensive to do the protection and the maintenance that you need to do to get these trees and shrubs and plantings up to the level of, um, you know, five to 10 years past planting where you can then sort of step away and let them continue to grow. They do take a lot of um, input and maintenance. And so I think that's one of the big challenges that we see. Excellent, thank you. That's the opportunity for questions on working lands and natural climate solutions. Hearing nothing. I think that we're gonna thank you so much for your presentation today. And we're excited to continue to work with you on um, natural climate solutions and on this climate pollution reduction grant going forward because uh, we have a lot of working lands out here and we they don't get the credit that they deserve. So um, we're excited to work with you, especially in kind of the quantification of some of the carbon benefits. Colleen, if I have one more minute, I would just add one one additional piece, and that is to say that um, over the last year, the Oregon Global Warming Commission has been working on a natural and working lands project. Uh, but part of that is um, a list of recommended practices, and that should be um, available, that list of recommended practices uh, was put together by technical and stakeholder advisory groups. Um, and there is a fairly substantial list of practices that could be of interest, including, I think there were five or six from the rangelands. Um, so I, I'll just flag to keep your eyes open for that because that might be a good place to engage and to think about um, which practices are, are being considered at the state level. Thank you for flagging that. And I also, we have your uh, Nature Conservancy handbook, the Natural Climate Solutions Handbook. Stuff in it. I have a quick question about timing for that um, proposed natural and working lands um, effort from the Oregon Global Warming Commission. Do you know timing on looking out for that? Yeah. You're muted again. Okay, there we go. Um, sorry, my there's a lag on my on my clicking of the button. Um, I would say in the next month or two. Um, I'm not. I haven't seen it pop up on their agenda yet. Um, so I would keep 
it, it should be soon, but I'm not sure exactly when. Yeah, maybe time with your with maybe before uh, at least more than yeah. And we do have a, a tribal member who's on that global warming commission. Cheryl Shippentower is on that commission, so maybe we can oh. check. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much, Rose. We really appreciate your expertise. And we're welcome to hang out, but I know we're all busy. Um, can I do soil carbons and then kind of talk about the Columbia River Board Commission? That I can go whenever you want. Yeah. I feel like that's probably a good segment, segue because um, she talked about some of the carbon benefits and that yeah. ties in nicely to the soil. So if anybody comes to help me here, it goes this way. You get onto the screen. Very counterintuitive. So I am going to piggyback on about our soil carbon and why it's important and why it's wonderful. And so I think that this is a nice natural segue from working land. So here's the poster that Rose and Stacy helped develop. And so from there, you know, we talked about the cover crops and things. And so that's kind of why I wanted to segue into our um, soil carbon. So there's a little bit of that conversation on there. And so um, it's a natural part of the soil. It's a very important component of the soil and makes up quite a bit of the soil. Uh, and actually, if we have more soil organic matter, which carbon is part of that, uh, the soil is healthier and can hold water better and produces stronger plants that, you know, may need less fertilizer uh, and might be able to uh, compete against the weeds more efficiently. And so there is a lot of non-carbon benefits to improving the carbon that we have in our soil. Um, the little bubble that says understanding sequestration on there, it's important to understand that carbon is uh, taken up into the soil in a couple different layers. Um, what we call accretion. So there's carbon sequestration and carbon accretion. Uh, when we accrue carbon in the soil, that's when we're kind of just pulling it out of the atmosphere very preliminarily. If we start tilling the soil up, that carbon is going to be re-released. And so we don't actually, we can't actually call that sequestration because it has the potential to escape back into the environment. But when that carbon is broken down by uh, microorganisms in the soil, then it becomes sequestered. It becomes mineralized and is not able to be released with those tillage activities as easily. And so it's important to look at soil, not just in the way that we can kind of immediately put back soil through no-till activities, but how we also support our microbe uh, activity, our microorganisms uh, in the soils that actually do that really helpful mineralization. Um, and then the next little bubble over there does touch a little bit about Rose, what Rose talked about. Um, you see uh, the level that forests, grasslands, agriculture, and wetlands really have uh, in this process. And so um, you can see forests. We have quite a bit of forests out here, and we're, the working lands was a really good example of that. Uh, and then wetlands over here contributes quite a bit of that riparian restoration action. But agriculture also has a lot of opportunity to be part of this uh, natural climate solutions. Uh, but that depends on how we manage it. And so it's things like moving from conventional tillage, which is extremely destructive, to the soil uh, organisms and releasing carbon into the environment. Uh, if we till or reduce tillage activities, that can improve not only our carbon storage, but also reduces runoff into the rivers, which is a, a effect for fish and aquatic ecosystems. Um, but then we can also be doing things like planting cover crops in this uh, the winter time. And that was something that Rose had talked about uh, might be a little bit of a challenge out here in Eastern Oregon. I'm glad Stephen just walked into the room. Um, is that the that contention for moisture? You know, out here in Eastern Oregon, we are an arid environment, and so there is a lot of conventional thought that if we are planting cover crops, those cover crops are going to take up moisture that then that cash crop wouldn't have access to. And I think that the Columbia Basin Agricultural Research Center, along with the USDA Agricultural Resource Service, Research Service uh, outside of town here, uh, has done some preliminary 
research into whether or not cover crops do take up all of the moisture that could be necessary. And the preliminary information is that it doesn't. Uh, I know that there is a lot of uh, hesitation about that. And so it would be interesting to talk with people like Stephen at the Seabark station to learn more. Which brings me to my last bubble on here. Um, we here in the kind of Pendleton, uh, Columbia River Basin area, we're really lucky because we have actually soil carbon research plots in the country. They were started in the 1930s and they have been running ever since. And so we have some of this really long-term data that other places don't have access to for their conditions, it's relevant for their conditions. And so um, there was really an opportunity to work with the places like Seabark to understand how we can be better uh, uh, managing our farms, especially, you know, the tribe has farming operations and uh, there's quite a bit of dry land agriculture out here. Uh, and so this is really an opportunity for us to, again, look at our working lands and see how we can be managing them, not just for the success of the crops and the communities around them, but for the carbon benefits as well. Uh, and so I would welcome any questions or I would love Stephen to maybe make a comment on the work that Seabark is doing. Please just say something. Oh, sorry, I'm just coming in. I don't know why. Um, but, but anyway, um, I think the most important thing we've done, discovered in the plots is that since the beginning of cultivation in the 1800s, we have lost more than half of the carbon. Wow. With our farming practices. This is because we are tilling, so following. So one crop in two years, not creating enough biomass, you know, to add the carbon. And then we till on top of that. And so we're mixing the residues, microbes, and then the oxidation. So we lose a lot of organic matter. When you lose a lot of organic matter, like you Oh, no, then you lose your water holding capacity, you lose, you lose your nutrient water uh, holding capacity. Many things happen. So we are in a downward trend. I mean, practice. so we're trying to find ways to reverse that, you know, more intensive cropping, more cover crops like you're indicating. Again, moisture is a problem. So we're looking at many other, you know, many other, you know, practices like bringing in uh, biochar, which is uh, biological carbon uh, from if, from forest waste to replace that carbon. Because most of the biochar will have about eighty percent of carbon. So we're trying to bring the biochar from the forest into our agricultural lands to remedy that. So it has been quite a process. We have lost our organic matter and our productivity. Thank you. Yeah, that's excellent. Um, does anyone have anything that they want to add or questions specifically about the soil carbon? I wanted to ask you if you guys have uh, experimented with worm casting through compost. No, we haven't done much, but we, we have got plus there where we put carbon in. Oh, okay. And those are the best plots. Okay, right. <laughs> because we are putting carbon on, you know, back okay. and the nitrogen. So we are maintaining our carbon in those plots uh, since the 1930s. <laughs> so it's almost like a common Biochard uh, use more water? Biochar actually will hold more water. It was like a teaspoon, tablespoon of biochar is the surface area of almost half a people. So it can actually help you know, hold the water, increase the water holding capacity. Yeah. Can I ask you a question about that? I'm learning some about biochar. Yeah. And is it um is one of the barriers or challenges right now with biochar the cost to different agricultural producers? Not that it couldn't be made pretty readily available, but just the cost to be able to use it at a larger scale on a on an ag producer's land? Yeah, two things. I think one is people are not yet aware of it. And then uh, the cost as well, because few entities are producing it. But NRC is, is subsidizing biochar. But we have to have a biochar which is based compost. 
because the biochar itself is going to high carbon to nitrogen ratio, which means if you put the raw biochar in the soil, it will hold a lot of nitrogen from the from the parts. So so the some of the, the ratios are up to five part of two. So the NRCs want a biochar mixture which is 30 or 20 carbon to nitrogen ratio. Then they'll help you uh, with uh, the finance part of it. It's called called 808. NRC is called 808. So it's a solar amendment code. And they'll, they, they are actually they, they have seen the benefits of biochar and they are willing to make it to a farm program. We should pursue. Yes. Yeah, things that are already happening and things that we could be expanding or delving deeper into. So I appreciate that. Uh, any lingering thoughts on soil carbon and agricultural systems? Excellent. Pizza, you're up. So, uh, questions online? <laughs> Okay, so now we're going to move uh, back to a little bit more of those working lands, which has also been part of um, But we are excited. Go over here. Where so the camera, there? yeah, the camera shows over there. Okay. Unfortunately, that's okay. Yeah, not the best. Okay. It is. are up and going. Okay. Um, good morning, everybody. Thanks again for the opportunity to be here. And I'm learning a lot. So Colleen, thanks for the invitation. Um, my name is Lisa Noscook, and I work for the Columbia River Gorge National Scenic Area for the um, Columbia River Gorge Commission. And um, the Gorge Commission is a bi-state agency that together with the uh, Forest Service, that's land use policy for about 85 miles of the Columbia River that I'll show you in a map um, in just a minute. So, um, um, my primary role uh, with the Gorge Commission in the last three and a half years that I've worked for them has been in um, climate planning and long term monitoring. Um, and as a land use agency, um, I always like to start by acknowledging the original stewards of the land that we um, are responsible for us or our policy. And so it's really just this little section here that is the uh, national scenic area, but the indigenous the peoples who have uh, stewarded these lands since time immemorial um, hold relationship with this, this place today. And we work with um, the four treaty tribes specifically through a government to government relationship and role, and as well as our staff to staff relationship. So this map from Cryptic just um, shows you who those four treaty tribes are, including the Federated Tribes of the Um Quick orientation, here's the map of the National Scenic Area. And so along with that <clears throat> overlap of um, Seeded lands for both Warm Springs and um, Yakima Nation. We have, you know, all of these different jurisdictions and overlays. We've got these six counties here, three in Oregon, three in Washington. Um, and then we have 13 urban areas or communities. So places like Hood River, um, the Dalles and Stevenson along that our policies don't apply to those urban areas, but in the other areas um, outside of those, they do. And so um, what I wanted to share with you today is really just a very brief overview of the climate plan and specifically touching on where um, I think there's really exciting work to be done and we're learning a lot from the tribes and had the opportunity to, to follow and kind of learn from the leadership of Umatilla in particular with the climate adaptation plan um, is three priorities in our plan around strengthening protection of tribal treaty rights specifically first foods protection and access, um, thinking about that overlap with wetlands and protection and um, adding in carbon sequestration in the ways that we can within our land use role, maybe make an impact um, in sequestering 
carbon as well. So this is maybe a little hard to see on the, the main screen. The poster out there has it too. But just to emphasize that our plan um, includes both adapting to climate change and um, mitigating or reducing the sources of greenhouse gas emissions and um, you know, enhancing those sinks. So we've got uh, our overall priorities here in both our approach of how we want to be inclusive in our work and um, all of the diverse communities across the gorge and as well as the tribes. Um, thinking about how to protect high climate resilient areas or those places that are expected to be resilient in the face of climate change. And then we have our kind of main adaptation priorities being cold water refuge streams, wetlands, um, first foods and strengthening that protection of tribal treaty rights, and then oak woodlands. On the mitigation side, we're looking um, at trying to work with partners to play a supportive role. We don't regulate greenhouse gas emissions and transportation per se but we do have a role with permitting things like EV infrastructure um, or charging stations, being part of regional networks with reducing congestion in what is a, a highly visited area if you've gone through the waterfall corridor and there's safety concerns there as well as idling cars. So trying to reduce single passenger um, trips whenever possible, uh, mentioned EV infrastructure. And then there's the carbon sequestration and fire risk. And fire risk, as you all know, is really it's, it's kind of a resilience, adaptation, mitigation, all of those combined. Um, but what the fires in the gorge have definitely told people and sh uh, really emphasized in recent years is that the entire national scenic area is essentially a wild and urban interface that is um, has a lot of communities that um, are at risk of fire. And we also acknowledge the traditional role of fire and the need for fire on the landscape and that we have to live with it. So we're learning a lot from the Washington uh, Fire Adapted Communities Learning Network, and we're part of that. And um, so that's another priority there. So a couple things. Um, do I just have a couple minutes probably, right? You're fine. I'm not even back anymore. Okay. <laughs> um, I'll, be, I'll be quick. Uh, I just wanted to, to share sort of the intersection as I see it and really invite reflections on this. Um, we're very much in a learning, learning stage um, with these things right now. And so when you look at this goal, our goal in the plan, it is time bound. Um, I simplified them here, but it's really to, to learn and to um, be able to listen from the tribes that we work with to align any potential policy changes that we might make with the goals and interests of tribes, because there are all of these plans like the one that you worked so hard on. Um, so we're, our kind of initial steps have been some of these staff to staff meetings. We've um, offered some additional ideas in, in our climate plan, but one of the things we've heard a lot about is just better need for just information, education to people from like the residents and visitors that are going through the gorge to actually our county planners. There's um, stories that we hear just about people being stopped when they're practicing traditional gathering practices that they have a relationship with the landowner, but the county law enforcement doesn't understand that. Um, and so I feel that uh, just some initial steps we've had where we've had a woman from the Aqua Nation talk to at our county planners meeting. This is all planners from all six counties. So learning and listening on how we can actually be sharing some, some basic information on people are in this landscape, a whole relationship, have uh, for millennia and still do today. So that's kind of an initial role that we've tried to play in sort of like convening some of those conversations. And then we've also had some recent presentations on tribes um, climate work to our Gorge Commission. One interesting thing about our agency is we've got a, a oversight board that is appointed by both governors in both states as well as each county. So it's a diverse group of folks. So we've got a couple tribal members actually in leadership positions right now, two indigenous women from Warm Springs and Colleen presented on um, Umatilla's plan. And we've also heard from the lead of uh, the Yakima Nation on climate too. And we hope to be doing more of that from hearing from Nez Perce and um, Warmer Springs as well. One of those other adaptation priorities that really overlaps with um, first food protection is getting a better understanding of where the extent of wetlands are we have a no wetland loss goal in the management plan. Um, and at the site level, 
know, there's specific things that are done if there's a proposed development and buffers and looking at plant surveys. But on the whole, at the landscape level, um, we to date haven't had like a really comprehensive map to know and to have it kind of be ground truth. So we're working on that and um, initially have that kind of be our proxy for understanding condition by just really making sure that we first know the extent. And that plays into as a first step um, thinking about carbon sequestration, because one of the things that's really interested to learn from Rose, I looked at her um, her study, but when we were thinking about how we might track or focus on carbon storage and sequestration within the scenic area, we, we wondered, you know, is there a way to take the extent of these different land cover types and do some sort of calculation, you know, to get an estimate of what their potential is, whether you're talking about grasslands or wetlands or coniferous woodlands. And um, we realize it's there is so much work being done but on the scale of the National Scenic Area and the really things in flux. Um, it's complicated and we don't have a lot of capacity to like do our own modeling efforts. So we're very interested in learning about what others are doing and if there's some way that we can kind of even do like you know, qualitative assessment to start, but just better understanding how we can really make recommendations to landowners that we know have some benefits. Um, we're interested in learning more about that. Yeah, so a couple other things are just examples of actions there that I won't go into much detail, except that I think beaver are talked a lot about now, and we definitely heard a lot about that um, from a couple of the tribes. So we did include some language about trying to support beaver coming back where they can. Yeah. Let me ask a question. Yeah. This is just going to express some of my ignorance about the topic, but I was on the City of Pendleton's Planning Commission for a while, and we as a city uh, were required to um, approve a wetlands map. And it was led by a sub consultant for DLCD on this. And I just wonder if you would be defining it differently than they would, or if you would be able to make it take advantage of things that are required by the state to inform your wetlands map. I, I, yeah, no, I, I'd be interested to see what what they used. I mean, there's national wetlands inventory data. So kind of these national data sets that we are looking at for various um, land cover. But as, as I understand it from our GIS manager who I'm working with, that is one that we're going to initially. But then it's, especially since we're by state, there's actually more detailed information in Oregon. And it it may be coming through, um, you know, just like it's it's accumulating as development happens. And then there's better like on the ground information. And so that data set that comes from Oregon, I'm not sure if it is managed through DLCD, is a little better than currently what we have for Washington. So what we'll be doing is really kind of having some, some caveats as we're like clipping this to the scenic area. But um, yeah, it's, it's kind of like the combination of, I know what can sometimes be available nationally and then what is specific depending on what you do. But I'd be interested to just see what you, approved yeah as well, as as I, that's a longer story than time today but yeah. I do know I do know that the process included some aerial mapping review but also site visits when things were in question I, and it it seemed fairly detailed although uh not on the planning commission anymore but I know there uh, a couple of the commissioners had their heels dug in on particular topics that they thought were encroachment on future development. So anyway, but the map was very detailed. It's really the takeaway, and it was a requirement of the state. So I could connect you with people I was talking yeah, to. I would like to talk more about that. That's, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so we've talked a little bit about this. We're very much in a learning stage, as I mentioned. We don't have specific measurable or time-bound goals right now because part of with the first step was getting a better um, mapping system of where the extent of these protected habitats and kind of land types are, everything from agriculture. What is we have agriculture is a protected use that we don't regulate um, what types of agriculture occurs, but we have land use designations about where it can occur. And you know, trends like more vineyards in certain parts of the gorge um, when the land use designations were created back in the early 90s, it was based on what was done then, and there was a little more grazing. 
orchards. We still have lots of orchards, but we're definitely seeing more vineyards in certain eastern parts of the scenic area, and they have different um, kind of demands and interactions with the landscape. And so one of our steps is to try to um, better understand that both the extent and then the nature of agricultural use within the scenic area, again, as sort of that foundation for at some point, maybe being able to estimate carbon um, sequestration benefits. Uh, one other thing, just a couple, just to sort of share, I guess, within our role, because we're not direct land managers, you know, we're not doing the on the ground restoration work, but we work with the Forest Service as one of the main ones that, that is, but also with, within local conservation districts and those people that are directly working with owners, trying to share information and uh, kind of serve as a conduit for information for people who do want to do work on their own properties. And the last thing is just really thinking more about policy op options where we could streamline our permitting process can be arduous for some and we've heard from those that are doing restoration work you know we want to have more restoration happen the kinds of good work we want to see that happen um, more quickly so taking a hard look at some of the, the specifics in the plan and how we might update that is also kind of on our list of action that's all I have. Those are a few of our commissioners. That's a few staff from the pandemic, so we're spread out <laughs> by the Wind River. But um, if you're interested at all in just seeing what those climate action priorities are, you can use that QR code. I know there's a dinosaur in the middle, but um, or just reach out to me anytime. I'm, I'm very interested in learning more about what everybody's doing and any opportunity to collaborate. And once again, we're just really grateful to have the opportunity to be here. Holly, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, you remind me your name. Is, are you Lisa? I'm Lisa. Yeah. And I don't even know if I said that at the beginning. That's I just said I worked for the Columbia Commission. What organization are you with? I work for the Columbia River Gorge Commission. So we're by state uh, agency. Yeah. So I have I have two things. One, just just because you mentioned the gorge, it's the area I've worked on the geology a long time. So. I'm coming, and I don't know when it's going to be. We're producing a brand new geologic map of the gorge area in cooperation with the U.S. Geological Survey, so that entire corridor. So that's upcoming, and that's kind of the base that informs a lot of the, you know, future understanding of how vegetative patterns develop and everything, landslides and land change. I guess I should say. So just for your information, yeah. that's, that's coming, and I can send you an, an abstract that we published to the Geological Society of America on that. Uh, the second part is when you're talking about mapping some of these um, different vegetation areas or wetlands, um, have you or your team gotten into using the LIDAR topography that we in Washington have collected for this? Well, we've looked at some LIDAR. I, we've often used what the Forest Service has, but when you say what you have collected, the specific or I'm sorry, did you say the state of Washington? We collected the entire state of Oregon and, yeah. and we collected, we, we've collected the data for a lot of Western states as the Oregon LIDAR Consortium. We kind of started this process in 2007 through our agency. Uh, the data that might be of interest to you is that there's a couple of products that come out of LIDAR collection. That's looking at just the bare earth where we take, we strip off all the vegetation and everything and look yeah. at just the rocks and the landscape. We also have what's called the highest hit model, though. And so you can do vegetative surveys based on this, where the lasers hit the canopy of different types of trees and things, or wetlands or vineyards and stuff. There's a distinct signature to different types of trees and vegetation. Okay. So, um, you know, I'd be happy to sit down with you at some point with our LIDAR team and talk about the data and how you might use that in a GIS analysis to look at these things. And the other part of it is that over time, there will be serial LIDAR collections. So, you know, an area collected in 2010 will be collected again in 2020 or, or whatever. So we're doing this in Eagle, the Eagle Creek burn. Yeah, that, okay. Yeah. So that's the context that I'm most familiar with LIDAR is past work with the Forest Collaborative. So in the forestry context of looking at canopy cover, I have, I think the challenge that what I've been told in the last couple of years was getting that um, those flights are like having it be at a regular frequency for our geography. So you're saying that what you're working on is something that is recurring 
Right. Okay. So typically the way this has happened is that an organization such as yourself might say, we're interested in, in LIDAR and it doesn't exist for this area. And then we'll find a bunch of partners around the gorge or other areas that can, you know, glom onto that project and make a better uh, rate of collection. So the more people that are involved in large the area, the cheaper it is to, to fly that. And that's kind of our role yeah. in the state to do that. Okay. But, um, the state is now within the next three years going to be 100% collected. And so I'm pivoting to look at legislative concepts where we go in and talk about specific corridors within the state that we want to have a distinct program to collect like the coast and look at coastal change on a serial pattern. The gorge, because of its um, importance culturally, but also as a major infrastructure corridor for the state. I mean, we often think about I-5 in the Willamette Valley. We don't realize that really the major corridor in the state for energy manufacturing, this kind of thing is actually the Columbia River and I-84. Um, and so that would be a corridor concept that, you know, we would like to work with other groups and get that legislative support to get funding to do, you know, maybe it's five years, maybe over 10 years. I, I don't know what yeah. that looks like yet, but that's the kind of information if you want to assess change. For sure. Yeah. No, I'd like to talk more with you about that. and. Um... I won't take any more time, but I but that is the challenge we've had is that we wanted to work with counties to kind of get because we know that there is some lidar available that our GIS guys have been looking at, but but yeah, at the scale that we need and in getting those people together and the funding to do it, like if this were something that actually had some kind of consistent support, that's the challenge. I'll need my card because the the people that work in our lidar team, you know, they're the ones creating the data and organizing all this, and really are. It, I think really help you. Yeah, um, yeah for sure. I feel like there's a lot of shared interest in that region, so it's just about. Oh, we serve it on our website. You can download it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. This yeah. No, I just wanted to bring that. Yeah, I really appreciate that. Yeah.